Hi guys, it's Sophie from In The Mess. Today we're going to talk to you about high blood sugars. This is a big topic, but we're going to try and break it down into a few useful points for you. The two main conditions we worry about with hyperglycemia are the hyperosmolar hyper are the hyper hyperglycemic hypros is it hyperosmolar hyperglycemic <laughs> are diabetic <laughs> These are hard words. A few moments later. The two main conditions that we worry about with hyperglycemia are the hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state and diabetic ketoacidosis. Both of these conditions occur more commonly in people with diabetes, but they can be seen as the result of acute illness or steroid use in people without diabetes. Diabetic ketoacidosis is mostly seen in people with type 1 diabetes, but can be seen in people with type 2 diabetes, particularly those that are taking SGLT2 inhibitors. Generally what happens is that there's an inadequate amount of insulin circulating to allow for glucose to go into the cells and normal glucose metabolism to occur. This can either be due to failure to take medication, aberrant administration of medication, or defects with insulin, particularly due to storage. It can also be the result of an intercurrent illness, such as sepsis or myocardial infarction, so look for an underlying cause. In these patients, because the glucose can't get into the cells, it's circulating around the body, and it is excreted out of the kidneys, and this takes water and solutes out with it. This leads to your patient becoming very, very dehydrated. Intracellularly, the cells don't have glucose to undergo aerobic respiration, so they switch to fatty acid metabolism. When the fatty acids are broken down, they produce ketone bodies. When these get into the bloodstream, these are acidic, and that contributes to the metabolic acidosis. The most important thing is to recognise diabetic ketoacidosis. Have a high index of suspicion, check your patient's blood sugars, and if it's above 14, check for ketones as well. Do an A to E assessment, particularly looking out for signs like Kussmaul respiration, which might point you towards your diagnosis. Take a venous blood gas to check their pH and their bicarbonate levels. Severe DKA is indicated by a pH less than 7.0 or a bicarbonate less than 5. Other signs of severe DKA are signs of organ dysfunction, such as SATs less than 92%, blood pressure less than 90 systolic, or altered mental state seizures or coma. Because your patients will be profoundly dehydrated, they'll need IV fluid resuscitation and they need quite a lot of fluid. At the moment, we use an isotonic crystalloid solution such as 0.9% saline, but Hartman's or Plasmalite can be used if none is available. Your patients will also need an IV insulin infusion to bring their blood sugar down into a normal range. This will allow the cells to take up the glucose and revert back to aerobic respiration using glucose as fuel. It stops the fatty acid metabolism and stops the production of ketone bodies. These are excreted through the kidneys over a period of time. The aim is to bring the blood sugar down to a normal range and continue the insulin infusion until the ketones are no longer detectable. To do this, once your blood sugar falls into a normal range, you might need to start giving a glucose infusion alongside the insulin to drive that glucose metabolism until all the ketone bodies are gone. Your patients will need regular venous blood gases to check that their pH is coming back to a normal range, to check their ketones are normalising, and to check that their glucose is under control. Don't forget to look for an underlying cause for your patient going into DKA, to speak to the community diabetes team, and to continue your patient's long-acting insulin if they're taking it. This is really important so that they can go back to eating and drinking and taking subcut insulin as normal, as soon as possible. Patients with DKA need a high level of monitoring. Therefore, they should either be managed on a specialist diabetes ward, in a medical high dependency unit, or if there are signs of end organ dysfunction, in critical care. Speak to your seniors about the right placement for these patients and escalate early if there are any concerns. Complications of DKA include cerebral edema, pulmonary edema, electrolyte abnormalities such as hypokalemia, as they will often be very, very potassium deficient, or venous thromboembolism due to hyperviscosity. Your patients will need regular monitoring, including biochemistry, to ensure that these complications don't occur. The hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state tends to occur more commonly in people with type 2 diabetes. In these patients, extremely high levels of blood glucose leads to an osmotic shift similar to that seen in DKA. 
However, they often have a small amount of background basal insulin secretion ongoing, so they still have glucose shifting into cells, and they don't go into fatty acid metabolism and ketone production. Therefore, it is a non-ketotic state. There's often an underlying intercurrent illness, an element of dehydration, and these patients may not be on the ideal management for their diabetes. It's more commonly seen in frail patients who may be in nursing home or institutional care. Generally, the signs of a hyperosmolar hyperglycemic state are hypovolemia, significant hyperglycemia, often with a glucose above 30 millimoles per litre, but without evidence of acidosis or ketone production, and a raised serum osmolality. Any intercurrent illness such as heart attack or sepsis can trigger the HHS, but it can also be drug-induced from things like diuretics or steroids. HHS has a more insidious onset and may present over the course of several days to weeks. It can present with fairly vague symptoms such as muscle cramps, headaches, malaise, nausea and vomiting. Patients may become more confused or have an altered mental state. As the condition progresses, neurological deficits may be noted or patients may present with seizures or full-blown coma. Again, it's useful to do an A to E assessment and look for any underlying cause. Take use knees and remember to check your patient's biochemistry. You can expect to see a high sodium due to the level of dehydration, but they may be deficient in other electrolytes such as potassium. If you can find an underlying cause, such as pneumonia, you need to treat this. Your patient will need fairly aggressive fluid resuscitation with an isotonic crystalloid solution, again 0.9% saline or plasmolite, to normalise their volume status. It's really important that they have the fluid resuscitation before they're given any IV insulin. Although it is tempting to correct the hyperglycemia as quickly as possible, giving the IV insulin causes a shift of glucose intracellularly and water will follow this. And so you can actually lead to complete circulatory collapse and cardiac arrest if you treat with IV insulin before you've given adequate fluid resuscitation. So just try and rehydrate your patients first. These patients will need regular monitoring of their sodium and potassium levels. It depends on how unwell they are, but regularly checking sodium roughly every eight hours to check that it's not falling too quickly. You don't want it to fall by more than 10 millimoles over a 24 hour period. This can lead to central pontine myelinolysis if it's corrected too quickly, and that's irreversible. Again, these patients are at risk of cerebral edema, organ failure, and venous thromboembolism, so monitor them carefully while they're in hospital. The mortality from this condition remains relatively high at 15 to 20%, so good management early is really important. Have a chat with your seniors about where they're best placed in the hospital. A specialist diabetes ward would be ideal, but if they have signs of organ dysfunction, high dependency or critical care may also be required. So in summary, if your patient has a high blood glucose, check for ketones. Remember to give aggressive fluid resuscitation as they're probably very dehydrated, and you will want to start an insulin infusion, but do this in a controlled fashion following a protocol and with support from your seniors. Don't forget to like and subscribe so you never miss a thing.